Hey everybody, um, about a, wow, well, probably about a year and a half or so ago, I did a series of videos called The Uniqueness of the Christian Hope, and one of the videos was uh, How Credible Were the Swoon and Hallucination Theories Concerning Jesus' Resurrection Appearances. And this morning I saw in my comments inbox, pretty nice dude with the username MJT532, um, he is a, non, a former believer, a skeptic, but uh, I, I had addressed Paul, the, the concept, the notion of Paul having an hallucination on the road to Damascus in this video, and why I didn't think it was that, that tenable. Um, I want to take a look at what he had to say. Um, let's see here. Paul could have had an, an hallucination from the combination of exhaustion and guilt, no need for him to admit that in his writings. And um, I, I just said to him that, uh, here's what I said to him about Paul. I think I'll make a video later today addressing the probability of him having an hallucination. I'll email it to you and see what you think. Um, a little further, I asked him if he was a believer or a non-believer. And he said, I'm a former believer, pretty rare breed. Not too many skeptics like myself will admit there's some compelling evidence in the Bible, such as the resurrection. I don't have a specific hypothesis for the resurrection. I think the real answer might be a combination of events, one or more of which might be somewhat unlikely, such as Paul dealing with Gail, the body be moved to another tomb, etc. Um, I, I really got to say, for, for a skeptic, Paul better have had an hallucination, because that uh, it, it's ridiculously unlikely that he just abandoned his life in Judaism, uh, you know, he he was he was he was rising, you know, climbing the the Jewish religious ladder with you know being a Pharisee and everything else. And I don't think he'd just you know be taken in by a good argument from Peter or whatever and decide to ditch Judaism uh, and then make up all kind you know lie saying Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. His character. In his letters, it does not strike me as someone who's a con artist. So, did Paul have an hallucination on the road to Damascus? Here's what has me rather skeptical of that being so. Um, after a lot of people have hallucinations, they tend not to have the ability to work miracles. Now, we're not, I'm not just talking about the stuff mentioned in Acts, and we'll get to Acts in a minute. Here's 2 Corinthians 2.12. This is Paul basically fighting for credibility with the Corinthians. They're being taken in by the fraudulent super-apostles. And he's trying to impress on them that he's a true apostle. And he's reminding them what happened when he was there. Here's 2 Corinthians 2.12. Signs that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, and miracles were done among you with great perseverance. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, I've made this case in a previous video. Um, I mean, there's no, there's no translation, no, no manuscripts errors, um, <clears throat> no manuscript, you know, variants, nothing like that. And I've mentioned in a previous video, Paul, Paul is reminding the Corinthians what he did among them while he was there. Uh, Saint, you know, if you're trying to build your credibility with people, you, you don't remind them of something, you don't lie to them and remind them of something that you didn't do when they could just think back and be like, what is this idiot talking about? He, he didn't do this when he was there. So apparently, Paul did do some pretty wild stuff when he was in Corinth. And, and you don't see him defending the quality of his miracles. He's just stating, hey, guys... You know, remember when I was with you? Were not the signs and you know signs and wonders things that mark a true apostle? Were they not present with me? Um, the only dodge I got from a skeptic on that one was, well, you know, Paul might have been sincerely be believing that he had seen Jesus Christ and he picked him out to be an apostle, and you know he convinced himself that he could perform miracles, and the Corinthians were. Maybe so taken by him that, you know, they believe that the, that what he could do were miracles. I, I don't know. It's like, okay, if you believe that, okay. 
Um, I, I, I don't know. Galatians 3.5. Now, once again, Paul is... Paul here is trying to tell the Galatians, look, you can't be doing this follow the law rubbish. You can't be getting circumcised, and if you want to do it, you got to follow the whole law. And he's, you know, he's putting up... He, he's holding up the superiority of faith versus following the Jewish law. Now, he says, Did God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Now, Paul was present in with the Galatians in Galatia. You know, he stayed with them, I believe, he mentions in his letter, which, again, is an uncontestably Pauline letter. I think he was there with them a year and a half. So he saw some stuff, and he's reminding the Galatians, you believe my message. And what, what happened once you believed it? Miracles were worked among you. And once again, does he even t defend the quality of them? And he say, hey, those, those, weren't ha you know, those weren't cheap card tricks or anything that you guys were doing. Those, those miracles came from God. No, he's simply building his case saying, the miracles that you worked when you believed my message and were baptized... Did obeying the law get you to work those miracles? So, in other words, the message that Paul came preaching, people believed on it, and they were able to work miracles. So, one other thing. I do want to bring up something in Acts. Acts 27. This, this is towards the end of Acts. So this is probably around 58. Paul sails for Rome, get, gets shipwrecked, and... Uh, Oh, they, they wound up on the uh, the Isle of Malta. Except I'm in the wrong chapter. This is not chapter 27. We need to look at chapter 28. Um, let's bring up Acts 28. Now, I bring up this chapter because this is pretty well into the life of Paul. Um, here it is, on the shore of Malta. Now what's said here? Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, put it on a fire, and a viper, driven out by the heat, fastens itself on his hand. The islanders saw the snake hanging from his hands. They said, this man must be a murderer. Uh, but Paul shook off the snake into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or fall dead. After waiting a long time, nothing unusual happened to him. They changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home, showed us generous hospitality. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands upon him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways. Okay, why do I bring up this particular incident in, in Acts? Well, here's the thing. When was Acts written? For starters, I, I think you could make a very very strong case that Acts was written before 62 AD. Why? Because the author of Acts records the death of the Apostle James, uh, the brother of John, the evangelist. He also records the death, you know, the death of Stephen, the first martyr. In other words, if people die, you know, if, it, if noteworthy Christians died, the author, who I believe was Luke, took note of it. James the Just, it's recorded by Josephus that he died in the year 62. Acts mentioned, and it was a pretty fantastic death. He got stoned by the Jews. Um, Luke mentions nothing about James dying. He, he wraps up the book. You know, Peter was probably cruci crucified around 64. Paul beheaded no, no earlier than, uh, no later than 68. Peter and Paul died under Nero. No mentions of it here. None. Um, and it just wraps up kind of with a ho-hum wrap-up of, of Paul, you know, living under house arrest for two years. If, if this was written within ten years of the foundation of the Christian community in Malta, I'd sure think, I, I think the heat would be on me to tell the story as accurately as I could tell it. And I certainly wouldn't be including the names of, like, public of chief officials, Publius. I mean, anybody could go to Malta, find the Christians there, and say, Hey, 
how, how did you guys start out as a community? And if they weren't saying, well, you know, the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked here, and he shook off a snake bite, and healed new sick people on the island, who's going to believe that book? Um, okay, some liberals will say, no, Acts was written around 85 to 90. I know Bar Bart Ehrman will say that. I would not make it, I would not say any later than 95, because this is, uh, First Clement, written around 96. And there's definitely an echo of Acts 2025. 20, uh, you were more willing to receive, give than to receive. That's an echo of, of what's written in Acts 20, excuse me, Acts 2035. So, no later than 90 or 95 for Acts. And, and frankly, <clears throat> even if that's when it was written, I, I don't think that's toxic to my argument at all. Because th this would still be within 40 years of, of the foundation of the Christian church on Malta. And all you'd have to do is, you know, head, head, up, head set, you know, set sail to Malta and say, look, is this true? You know, where are the Christians here? Did a guy named Paul heal the chief official's father? Did did he heal the sick people on this island? I gotta say the heat would be on me to tell the story as accurately as, as I could. And something tells me Paul did work those miracles on Malta. Um, did Paul have a hallucination on the road to Damascus? I don't know. If I was a skeptic, I, I just I wouldn't be in a big hurry to believe it. It, it just it it doesn't fit. Hope this helps. See ya.